Hi everyone, I thought I would start today's video with a, uh, a comic from xkcd.com that just shows how awesome mathematicians are and how awesome math is. Uh, so pause the video, give it a read. Um, maybe you get it, maybe you're entertained by it, but know that I am entertained by it. The section that we're going to be covering in today's video is 4.4 called Coordinate Systems. Um, something you're familiar with. You've been working with coordinate systems since, uh, I don't know, maybe middle school. Uh, but we get a glimpse at what they look like in linear algebra because, you know, uh, that's kind of where all this vector work is best represented. Uh, we start out the, the, the section with a theorem and we'll go through the proof of this theorem also because it's a pretty good one. Uh, it's called the Unique Representation Theorem. Uh, and in the theorem... We have a basis, b1 through bn, for a vector space v. Then each x in v, each x, each vector in that vector space, for each x, there exists a unique set of scalars. So that's where the term unique comes from in the theorem, such that cx equals that linear combination um, of vectors. So basically it says that every vector in the vector space can be represented in one and only one way by a basis. Okay? Um, and so the way that the theorem works, we're going to say, all right, or the way that the proof works, all right, we're going to say first that since our basis, since B spans V, there exist scalars. That, so we can, since it, by its definition, it spans the vector space, there exist scalars uh, such that that one that's this guy up here, that equation holds. Okay, so we have that that uh, representation. So we just have to show that it is in fact unique. And the way that we show something is unique in math is kind of cool. We're going to say suppose that, suppose also that uh, x equals d1, b1, plus d2, b2, etc., plus dn, Bn. So suppose there's other scalars that produce the same vector from my basis B. So for scalars, scalars D1 through Dn. All right, then if I subtract those two vectors, those two x's, 0 is equal to x minus x. Hopefully that's not a giant leap for you to take. Um, but that is equal to, and I can take those two vectors and rearrange them, or the, those two linear combinations, and rearrange them to show that c1 minus d1 times b1 plus c2 minus d2 times b2 plus etc all the way up to the last vector, cn minus dn times bn. So I subtract my two x vectors, I rearrange the terms and factor out my basis vectors. So that is equal to zero. All right. Then, or I'll say since, the other uh, 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 property of a basis is that it, one, spans the vector space, but it also, since b uh, is linearly independent, uh, then the weights must all equal zero. They must all be zero. Or, to put it differently, uh, C1 minus D1 equals zero. That tells me that C1 is equal to D1. Uh, ah, that's supposed to be a subscript. D1. Or C2 minus D2 is equal to zero. That is C2 equals D2, all the way up to the end, dot, 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 Cn minus Dn equals 0, Cn is equal to Dn, okay? That shows the uniqueness, right? If I say that x is represented one way, and then it could also be represented a different way, then, well, it's really not. Those scalars are still the same. That's, that's the argument that is taking place in this proof. Okay, so therefore that the, the representation is unique. So the representation is unique. And that's the end of the proof. Starting out the section with the proof, I'm sure that makes it your favorite. Next we get a definition for what is a coordinate 
Okay, uh, so suppose we have a basis B, which is a you know that set of vectors B1 through Bn. It's a basis for a vector space V, and then we have a vector in that vector space. The coordinates of x relative to the basis B. That's the what we're defining here. The coordinate vector for x is another way of saying it. I'll write that down in a minute. Or, or the B coordinates of x are those weights C1 through Cn such that x is that linear combination. So what we kind of showed is unique in the previous slide. Um, that's what we're defining here formally. Uh, the, the way that we write that notation-wise is with brackets around my vector x and a subscript of B. The coordinate vector of x. Let me write that down. The coordinate vector of x. And then I'll put in parentheses relative to B, my basis B. Uh, and that is equal to the weights C1 through Cn. So we write the coordinate vector for x as a vertical, uh, as, a, as a column vector of the weights that produce it from the basis. All right, now we have an example here where we're given a basis B, B1, B2, where B1 is that vector, B2 is that vector. And then suppose any vector x in R2 has that coordinate vector. The coordinate, we're given the coordinate back vector for x. We want to find the regular vector x. Okay, So this that we're given here is how you build x out of B1 and B2. But I want to know what is the original x. Okay, where was it originally? All right, so the way that we do that is, let's see, let's go with blue again. Uh, we're going to say x is equal to negative 2 times b1. I'll show you where that negative 2 came from in a second. Plus 3 times b, oops, there's supposed to be a 2 there, plus 3 times b2. The weights of in my coordinate vector for x are how I build it out of b1 and b2. Okay. So substituting those two vectors, x is equal to negative 2 times my b1 vector is 1, 0, plus 3 times my b2 vector is 1, 2, and then when you simplify all of that, uh, you get the vector 1, 6. And that's it. That's where the vector x is, and that's actually where the vector x is relative to the standard basis. Okay, relative to this different basis, that's where the vector x is. But they're actually the same place. That's what's great about it all. It's the, they, lay, they lay on top of each other, but negative 2, 3 is how I build x out of the basis vectors. 1, 6 are how I build x out of the standard basis. Now in example 2, uh, I'm basically going to rewrite what I said out loud at the end of the previous example. When I write x equals 1, 6, the entries of x are its coordinates relative to the standard st oops, standard basis. What is the standard basis? We write it with a funny looking e. That kind of e is equal to e1 comma e2. Um, in, in other things, you may have seen it as the i hat and the j hat. Um, but then I'm going to write it as 1, 6 equals 1 times 1, 0, i hat, plus 6 times 0, 1, j hat, or 1, e1, plus 6, e2. So that is, that, that's how to build x out of the standard basis with just regular i hat, j hat vectors. Now on this next slide, the graphical interpretation or representation of what we just did in those first in, the, in that first example is kind of shown. And I just took a picture out of the textbook. I know this doesn't look all that uh, glorious, uh, but if I build uh, my vector x out of the standard basis e1, e2, right? That's one unit in the e1 direction, in the i hat direction, and one, two, three, four, five, six units in the j hat direction. Okay, so that's how I build my vector out of those two. That's pretty standard, hence the name the standard basis. Uh, however, if I build my vector x up here out of the b basis, 
if you recall, it's negative one, negative two units in the B1 direction. So we're going two to the left, one, two to the left, and then one, two, three units in the B2 direction to get up to my vector X. However, it, and it might not look perfect because I just took a photo out of my textbook. That vector X up there is still one unit to the right and six units up. It's just a little bit harder to see on the slanty graph paper. So it's still over one up six. The, ve the pictures on the left and right can be laid on top of each other. One, you just get to X a certain way out of the slanty grid, and the other, you get to X in the regular way. That's what's going on here, visually. In example four, I'm given basis vectors again, and now I'm given a vector X, not the coordinate vector, the vector X, and we want to find the coordinate vector for X relative to basis B. All right. So in the previous, in the earlier example, we were given the coordinate vector, needed regular x. Here we're given regular x, need the coordinate vector. So we're doing something a little bit different. So in this example, I want to know what is the scalar c1 times the vector 2, 1 plus the scalar c2 times the vector minus 1, 1. That produces 4, 5. Whoa. Now, gosh, that sure looks like a vector equation. And if I recall, we solved vector equations by augmenting and doing some row operations. One, one, five. That sounds familiar, right? If you do those row operations, there should only be like, I don't know, two of them. You get one, zero, zero, one. And the last column is three, two, which tells me that the coordinate vector for x relative to my basis b is equal to those weights 3, 2. 3 times the basis vector b1 plus 2 times the basis vector b2 produces my vector x. Now a couple of things here on this next slide. Um, we're talking about this coordinate mapping. So if we think about our, our coordinate vectors as a linear transformation or a coordinate mapping from x to its coordinate vector, we could show, and we're told with theorem 8, which I'm not going to do a proof of, but it is in the textbook, um, that that mapping is a one-to-one -one linear transformation from v onto rn. Okay, And what it does, the purpose of that theorem and the significance of that theorem is we can take unfamiliar vector spaces and relate them to what we're used to working in, Rn, a real numbered uh, uh, you know, set of column vectors. So it takes this, the possibly unfamiliar and allows us to represent it, to understand it in a familiar way. And then we're given a, a definition at the bottom here for isomorphism. This doesn't really come up too much, but an isomorphism is the name for this one-to-one -one linear transformation. Okay. Well, this next example will kind of exemplify what we what is given in the previous theorem, okay? And I'm going to write this one out. So for example five, we're going to say let our basis B be the standard basis basis of P3. And P3 is polynomials up to a degree of 3. Okay, or we could just write down what b is. b is equal to 1 comma t comma t squared t cubed. So that's our basis that we're working with. All right, And then we'll say an element or a vector in p3, an element of p3 has the form p of t is equal to a naught plus a one t plus a two t squared plus a three t cubed. Right, so that's what a degree three polynomial looks like. Well, the coordinate vector for p relative to that basis b is well. Let's just rip off those scalars: a naught, a one, a two, a three, and it says that th that column vector is the coordinate vector for my polynomial relative to this basis. So take something that we don't typically think of as being a you know representable by a matrix because there's there's coefficients and variables, but 
it can be represented by a matrix, by a single column vector. Okay, and it's, so it's the coordinate vector of P relative to that basis. Now, in example six, uh, it says use coordinate vectors to verify that one, two, those three different polynomials are linearly dependent in P2. So polynomials being linearly dependent is maybe a strange uh, thing to think about, but they absolutely can be linearly dependent or independent because I can take one plus two t squared and write its coordinate vector relative to the base to the standard basis for uh, P2, for, for degree two polynomials. So that coordinate vector looks like this, one, zero, two. Why is the one there? Because I have a constant term. Why is the next term zero? Because there's no t to the first power. And then a two because there's two t squared. Then this middle guy here, that can be written as four, one, five. And then the third vector, or the third polynomial, can be written as, or is written as, 3, 2, and 0. Now, how do I know that those are linearly dependent if I take and augment this with a column of zeros? 1, 0, 2, 4, 1, 5, 3, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0. That uh, reduces to, let's see what I wrote here, 1, 0, 0, 4, 1, 0. 3, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0. So I lost a pivot in my row reduction. Here I have a missing pivot in column 3. Thus, that is linearly, linearly dependent. Boom. Okay. So those polynomials are linearly dependent. I can build one out of the other two. There's some linear combination that can write, you know, that can write one one of those three polynomials out of the others. All right, we got one more example to close out this section. Okay. We're given v1 and v2, those two vectors, and x. Our basis is the v1, v2 vectors. And then it says, then B is, a, B is a basis for H, which is the span of V1, V2. Okay, so we're given that all this information is kind of set up. So B is our basis, and it is a basis for H that is the span of V1, V2. Then determine if X is an H. So how do I determine if X is an H? If it is, find its coordinate vector. Okay, so the way that we do this problem, if X is in H then what do we know is true? If x is an h, then I can find scalars 3, 6, 2 plus c2 times minus 1, 0, 1. So I can find scalars that get me my vector x, 3, 12, 7. Then that it is consistent. Okay, and lo and behold, it is. Okay, and how do I know it is? If I augment that, I get 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 3, 0. So because that system is consistent, I know that first x is in h, but then it says find its coordinate vector. Well, you, you already did, so that's really great. So the coordinate vector for x relative to my basis b, we did this in an earlier example, is the two three this two and this three that we found by reducing that uh, system so that's my c1 and c2 that i would need to do it all right that is the end of section 4.4 thank you for listening have a wonderful day work on these problems let me know if you have questions thanks for listening